um, if you're going to tweet about this at all, feel free. That's not a problem at all. Just use the hashtag um, NTLT, NTL or NTL So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Zena Zembos Walker. I am a British born Greek Cypriot and I uh, was born in London and now currently live in Leeds. Married with two children and um, I've been in education for 15 years, uh, the last seven of which have been as a senior leader. So you've got my details there if you wanted to get in touch with me at all. So the at General Cena is my Twitter handle. So the first question I want you to think about is what are you a teacher of? And if you could just write some notes down to yourself, you don't need to enter that into that. But what are you a teacher of? There's a lot of content uh, which in this session from? today. So can I ask you <laughs> to mute, see if I can mute somebody. No, let's see if I can find something for you. No, oh, there's somebody who's talking. Can I ask that you mute your session, please? Or mute your microphone. Mute on the I'll see if I can do that myself. Okay, so what are you a teacher of? By the end of this session, I'm hoping that you'll have a clearer understanding of the importance of relationships and um, draw upon your own experience of school and education to reflect on your current practice to become the teacher that you truly want to be. So before we carry on, I want you to think about your own experience at school, whether that be primary or secondary or college or university. <clears throat> which teacher or teachers had an impact on you and why was that and you can write these down you can put the comments in the chat that's absolutely fine i can't see the chat at the moment so i won't be able to respond to that at present so what are the memories that you had were they fond memories were you happy did you not have a good experience the teachers you didn't like i want you to think about why in particular you didn't like them so how did they treat you how did they speak to you and more importantly, how did they make you feel? <clears throat> and what teacher, middle leader, senior leader, do you want to be remembered for? Now, Sue Cowley's book, Getting the Buggers to Behave, she asks you to think about the type of teacher you want to be. But I'm going that bit further and I'm asking you to think about your legacy. What type of teacher, middle leader, senior leader, do you want to be remembered for? And that legacy is really important. We'll be looking back at that later on. So what are your hopes and your dreams for your students? What skills and attributes and character traits do you want them to have when they leave your class, your school, the phase of education in which they're in with you? And what have you done and what will you do to support them to gain those skills and attributes and character traits? Some people argue that teaching children to know their place in the world and have the skills and attributes and character to live within it are more important than the outcomes that they achieve. But these are absolutely underpinned by the values for which we have for them to become global citizens. I'd urge you to follow um, Adrian McLean, who's in the room today. Um, he's under at character underscore guy on Twitter, and he's... Um, got some fantastic views and ideas and plans for building character into your curriculum. So definitely give him a follow, he's fabulous. For me, those skills, attributes and character traits go hand in hand with the credentials that they should be achieving when they leave school. And we need to think about considerations beyond education. So for instance, I went, to, I listened to a, a car recently and he um, was talking about leaving the school with 12 A stars, um, but actually not understanding how to open a bank account, not knowing what interest rates were or mortgages. And that's for a different day. It's a different conversation altogether. But what are we teaching young people for the world in which they need to live in? My education. Um, if I be honest, I have very, very few positive um, memories of school. At primary school, I had the scariest head teacher. She scared the daylights out of me. She would very regularly shout and scream at students in the corridors. I was bullied at school and my teachers had really low expectations of me. 
Uh, those low expectations I've come to realise recently was probably because um, being brought up in a, in a Greek household, my parents solely spoke to me in Greek at home. So I learnt English when I came to school. And I think, you know, back then when I was at school, the expectations of EAL students wasn't very high. And so um, they had already put a ceiling on me as soon as I'd entered the classroom. It was like, oh, maybe she won't be able to get this or she won't be able to achieve this target grade because she doesn't speak English. And that constant need for waiting for praise was, um, was really something that, that damaged me quite a lot. I remember doing an Egyptian project with my mum. She helped me cross-stitch um, a lovely picture of Cleopatra. And when we were talking about our month project, I stood up with my picture of Cleopatra and the teacher said, oh, isn't that wonderful? I bet your mum did really well doing that. Did she do the rest of your project for you? And that said to me, I, I can't believe that. I, she doesn't believe I've done this work. And that allowed the, the people that were bullying me to kind of go, yeah, see, look, Zeta didn't do her own work. She's, she's got other people to do that. And similarly, unfortunately, um, secondary school was, was a very similar experience. Um, you know, my tutor, who should have been my champion, my advocate, scared the daylights out of me. Um, I was bullied. Um, my teachers, again, had low expectations of me and I was never rewarded. And those low expectations, I don't know whether or not that was because of the reports that came up from primary school, you know, saying, you know, Zena quite, can't quite do this, you know, she's not ready here. Um, so those low expectations unfortunately stayed with me for, for my entire school um, career, primary and secondary. But I was lucky because I had my mum and dad and they never gave up on me. Um, they gave me every opportunity I needed to be successful. Um, they stood in my corner, like a bit, of a, a bit like a boxing ring. Every time I was knocked to the floor, they'd pick me up, pour the water over my head, and like, go girl, you go again. You're never going to give up. Um, I come from a family of educators. My dad was a teacher as well. And he said to me, you know, why don't you think about becoming a teacher? I thought, there is not a chance in hell I will go back to a place where I felt terribly unhappy. Um, and it took him five years to try and convince me. But he said this. Why don't you become a teacher? Then that way you can make school a better experience for students than what you had. And I thought about that. I thought, do you know what? You're right, Dad. I'm going to do that. Maybe I can make this a better experience. Maybe I can change how I feel about school by being a teacher. And um, unfortunately, I didn't have my maths GCC, so it took me a further two years. So seven years later, I managed to follow that, um, that path. <coughs> <clears throat> why? Why did I become a teacher? That, that's changed in the, in the 15 years that I've been in education. So as a teacher, I kind of went in with the idea that I really wanted to make school an experience that was memorable for all of the students that I was teaching. I wanted to make sure that children knew that they should believe in themselves and they could achieve absolutely anything they wanted to. And drama being my specialism, I wanted them to love my subject and see that drama could do something beyond acting. Two years after my NQT, I moved into middle leadership. I moved out of London and went to Milton Keynes. And my wife turned to deeper, wanting to deepen the experiences of children outside school. So those who had never been to the theatre before, I was determined they were going to have that experience because if they left school without having that, I knew they were unlikely to have ever been before or again. I wanted to develop a team of teachers and tutors to champion children and students. And of course, being the drama teacher and the, and the middle leader of a drama subject, I wanted to increase the number of students choosing drama GCSE. When I moved into senior leadership, the impact I wanted was, was a lot wider. So I wanted to develop um, staff. I wanted to develop teaching and learning policies within the school. I wanted to develop confident young people with character and increase their life chances. And of course, I wanted to support the communities in which we were serving. So that wider impact for me was really important. So what's your why? And you need to think really carefully about this because um, having that understanding of why you're where you are is really important and it will change and it will develop. So it's, I think if, if you revisit your why every now and again, just to ground yourself, that, that's something I think I've, I've done more recently than I have done previously. 
There is not a single person in education, regardless of the experience that they have, however many years they've had an education, when they've had that moment when you either want to scream your head off or bang a student's head against the wall because they really don't get it before you want to kill them. And it happens. But when communicating with students becomes difficult or near impossible, it's really important that we think about a new strategy to overcome that communication hurdle. And the communication hurdle is not for the students to think about and it's not for them to consider because we are the adult in the room and therefore we need to reflect on our own behaviours and think about the impact of those behaviours in the classroom and how that might impact on the behaviours of our students. What's equally important is knowing to regulate your own emotions before dealing with a difficult situation. I know that before when I'm not feeling quite ready and I've gone head first into a situation, I've lost control of it because I haven't thought about regulating my own emotions. So why do students misbehave? I'm really sorry, I can't see the chat, but you know, is it because they haven't eaten the night before? Is it because they've had an argument um, with their parent or carer? Is it because they have just recently found out their parents are getting divorced? Is it because they've witnessed some DV that morning and, and they're, they're scared about leaving their parent at home? There are so many reasons why young people and children misbehave. But the easy way out would be to on-call every student that misbehaves. And on-call in a lot of um, secondary schools for my primary phase teachers is where, you know, you've told a child to behave, they're still not behaving, you might call somebody to come and support you and they'll take that child out of the classroom and either have a conversation where that child feels they can go back in, but to be honest, nine times out of ten, they're taken out of the lesson altogether. We could just stick them in an isolation room all day until they learn to behave because miraculously after eight hours in isolation they come out and they have an epiphany and go oh I know why I behave like that I'll never do that again. We could tell their parents or carers could you please home educate them because they're just not quite ready for school. Or even better let's just permanently exclude the lot of them. But is that the right way? No it's not. And what's really important to remember, it's okay to ask for help and it's okay to ask for advice when you're struggling with behaviour. But if you don't pick up your own tab and you don't try to resolve those situations or that relationship with students yourself, it's really hard to win them over and therefore gain their respect. <laughs> I laugh a little bit, but 10x were... Um, probably the toughest class I ever had in my NQT year and they made me cry every single day for six months of my NQT year. And thankfully, that classroom was opposite the staff room where I would literally finish the lesson, see them off, run into the classroom and sob my eyes out. I'd be crying in the crying corner and be really upset saying things like, you know, I hate them, they hate me, why don't they care about their education? Why should I care if they don't care? I work really hard for them. What's their problem? It was always there, there, there. And it, I, I sat down and I thought, you know, what is going on here? I'm not ever going to pass this NQT here with a group like this. They're driving me absolutely crackers. And then I realized I, I didn't have any connections with them. I had no relationship with them. And so I decided that that day I was going to start and I started with the toughest kid, not only in that class, but the toughest kid in the school called Francis. He used to come into my lesson every day rapping and it would usually drive me mad because I'd be like, I just need to get through this lesson. You need to get through X, Y and Z before you leave and you're disrupting my lesson. So he came in as is usual, rapping, six foot four. And I said, you know, oh, um, what's your favourite rap artist? And he looked at me like I was a bit crackers and said, yeah, like, you know anything about hip hop -ness? And I said, oh, I do actually, you know, I, I love Tupac and I love Biggie and I like Q-Tip and, and his face just dropped. And at that moment, he said, I, I didn't realise you liked hip hop -ness. And I was like, yeah, I do, I love it. How about you do a little rap about my starter every single lesson? <laughs> and, and I had him from there, that was absolutely brilliant. He became quite protective of me. And so after that, anybody who misbehaved in my lesson, he'd stand up and say, you know, don't mess with Miss, she's teaching us. 
And in the playground, he'd say, anybody messes with Miss Zelenos, you, you've got me to contend with. But I went from making that relationship with him to building those relationships with the rest of the class and the, the rest of the, uh, the kids in the school. So we can't underestimate the importance of building strong and meaningful and unconditional relationships. If you haven't seen Rita Pearson, and I, and I will send you these uh, slides because I have links to videos that you might be interested in, but you need to watch this, is, is, is every kid needs a champion. And she says, kids don't learn from people they don't like. So my question to you is, are you likable? Are you likable? What makes you likable? And if you're not likable, why not? And this clearly links into, you know, the teachers that you remember at school. Why did you like them? And why did you not like the other teachers? What did they do? How did they make you feel? And then how do you want to be remembered? So your role in school, regardless of what it is, whether you are a cleaner, a caretaker, a member of admin staff, a TA, a head of year, a head of house, a senior leader, a middle leader. Students' behaviour has to be supported by everybody and that willingness to, to build relationships needs to be done persistently, insistently and consistently. Because pe building relationships is not about low expectations and this is something a lot of people feel. Having high expectations of your students, and I would say the high expectations, are the foundations of positive relationships. And you see, that's where your impact will come. Because once you've built that relationship, you can start teaching that content because they want to be in your lesson. They want to learn from you. And once they start to learn that content, they're making progress. And once they make that progress, they will gain those credentials that you're so desperately wanting them to get. Paul Dix has written a book, <clears throat> When Adults Change, Everything Changes. And I would say, every single member of staff in a school needs to read this book. Some, some great ideas and top tips on how to deal with behavior. He gives some great case studies as well. But he says you won't solve a child's behavior in a day, but eventually you will. And it's that unconditional, constantly trying every single day to build those relationships. The top tips, think about the way you meet and greet your, teachers, your students at the door. Are you someone who smiles at them, greets them, good morning, how are you? Or do you just frown at them? Are you happy to see them? And if you're not happy to see them, can you pretend that you are? Don't ever name and shame the behaviours you don't want to see on the board. By advertising them, you're saying to everybody else, this is the behaviour that gets my attention. So Jane, that's wonderful. I'm so pleased you've just sat down and started your starter activity. Here we go. Jane's name goes on the board. Andrea, aren't you wonderful? You've already started reading your book and starting that activity. Excellent, name on the board. Know your routines and be consistent with them every day, every lesson. It's so important that if you don't have those routines in place, that you get them in place. They understand and they know what you are expecting of them, how they should enter your classroom, how they should sit down, how they should exit your classroom. And responding to behaviors calmly, is so paramount. If you lose your temper and you shout, you've lost the battle already. But the most important thing for me is that you say sorry if you've got it wrong. Because if we can't teach our children to say sorry when they've made a mistake, we can't expect them to do it themselves. Praising in public and having that quiet word with the student that's not doing things quite right in, in private. Those clear boundaries again and high expectations every day, all day, every lesson and don't take things personally. Now I'm hoping I've got time, but I just wanted to very quickly go through something that happened to me and my husband last year. We were um, assaulted by a young man when we first moved up to Leeds and he admitted the assault. He got an extended youth offending order and I had the opportunity to meet him. And on the day I met him, I realized that this was a young man who had never been given an opportunity who had been kicked out of school, he was uh, attending an alternative provision. Uh, that day I decided to be his champion. And so I attended every single one of his panel meetings. I would message him every single week to make sure that he was okay. I would make sure that he had all of his equipment with him. 
his alternative provision, uh, we kept in touch. And he came out of that youth offending order um, a different child. And I'm pleased to say we're still in touch and he's now um, attending um, Leeds University, Leeds College, sorry, doing civil engineering. So I'm really, really proud of him. But you know what, that, the behaviour that he showed towards me, uh, I could have quite easily taken that personally and thought, you know what, he needs to go to prison. This is, this is not okay. So, Mark Finnis, fabulous man. I'd also recommend that he is also given a follow on Twitter. But he talks about changing your um, language towards young people. So if you are saying, instead of saying challenging behavior, let's call it distress behavior. If you're saying this child is attention seeking, let's call it attention needing. A difficult child is a child with difficulties and a tra troubled family is a family with troubles. The four ways of being are really important. So you've got your quadrant and you've got the challenge and support. So behind challenge are words like um, high expectations, are words like um, setting limits and boundaries. And behind the word support are things like nurture, love, compassion, empathy, and listening. So if you're somebody who has um, high challenge but low support, you're, you're falling into that two category where you're doing things to children. That's what we call a, a more punitive approach. Things are done to young people. And if equally, if you have high support but low challenge, you're doing things for children and therefore you're making excuses for them and you're in that rescue mode. But that's equally quite as damaging. We don't want to do things for children, otherwise I'll never learn to do things for themselves. If you're in the no challenge and no support, that, quite frankly, that I think that's neglectful practice. So um, I'm hoping that there's very, very few teachers that, that fall into that category. And if there is, we need to support them to come out of that. And with the with category, high challenge, high support. And that's the one I think is really important. So if we think about high, um, doing things with, there are limits, there are boundaries, there are high expectations, but these are matched and mirrored with lots of compassion, empathy, and listening. So it's, although it's a less punitive system, it's a more relational system, it's no less of the authority. It's just how we exercise these things that does things with children rather than to them. And the way we speak to young people can have a profound impact on their life and their future, and obviously their future generations to come. So a very short story I'll tell you about a froggy who fell into a well with a group of friends and they were jumping and screaming and shouting and they couldn't get out of this well because it was really deep. But another group of frogs came along and they looked down at the well and they started thinking, you know, they're crazy. They started shouting at them, you know, what are you doing? Save yourself. Don't bother. Just lie down, accept your fate. You're never going to get out of here. You might as well lie down and accept the fact that you're going to die. And slowly, slowly, what they were saying continuously started to resonate and started to make, make them feel, feel really bad. So one by one, these poor frogs lay down and accepted their fate and died. But there was this one frog that didn't. And he jumped and jumped and jumped. And the rest of them saying, what are you doing? Just, just stop, you're gonna, you're gonna die. Just, this is a painful death. But he got out. And when one of them said to him, why did you continue to jump when we told you you were going to die? He realized this frog was deaf and he couldn't hear him. And all he could see were the gestures. Those gestures, he took as encouragement. So every time he felt like giving up, he would see them waving their hands waving their hands and he thought they were saying to him keep going <coughs> so we need to remember that the things that we say the way that we behave could have the same destruction on young people and they see this in our day-to-day -day interactions on how we treat one another how um, staff treat students how students treat staff how students treat other students and you must be aware of your body language and your facial expressions also have an impact we go back to your why. If you're not in the place you want to be in, sooner or later your true self will come through and you won't be able to hold on to these things. I 
I'm not going to go through this whole slide, but I have underlined three things that I think are really important. These are the factors that contribute to student motivation and achievement. So that recurring um, forgiveness, that unconditional um, forgiveness and, and love that we show and compassion and empathy. But do your students, if you've had it to do with your student the day before, do they feel worried about coming back to your lesson the next day? And how have you made sure that they don't need to feel that worry or that concern? Do they feel that you're going to hold those grudges? And if they do, how are you going to make sure they no longer feel that grudge? <clears throat> Rita Pearson said that kids don't learn from people they don't like. But I'd also say that kids don't learn when they don't feel safe. So we need to also consider that. Engaging lessons. Are they highly tailored? Are they highly tailored to the point where each child in your class feels that you've planned that lesson especially for them? Are they exciting? Would you want to sit in that lesson yourself for an hour? And if not, why not? And you'll need to change it. <clears throat> and then you've got that feeling of belonging. They need that safety. They need that love. They need that uh, compassion. And they need to feel that every single lesson you want them to be there. So NEAT, and for anybody in the room that is a primary phase, NEAT is something that secondary schools and colleges are measured on, and they're measured on the destinations of the young people that left their school or college for three years afterwards. So uh, those young people who leave without an education, employment, or uh, and they're not in training, they're considered as NEAT. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking about this because I, feel, I really feel strongly and, and passionately about how important it is that we know these statistics, but the longitudinal study for young people in England gives, them all, gives some characteristics of young people who are neat and age 19. <clears throat> so those who've achieved five or more GCSE grades at nine to four are less likely to be neat. Those eligible for free school meals are more likely to be neat. Those who've ever been excluded or fixed term excluded are more likely to be neat. Those with their own child are more likely to be neat <clears throat> and those who have a disability are more likely to be neat but did you know that 15 percent of neat young people though those in not an education employment or training die within 10 years of leaving school and this is mainly due to drug and alcohol abuse they die so a school's work for this 15% of young people is a matter of life and death. And to put it into some context, if this is a class of 30, four to five of those young people could die before their 21st birthday. And that's um, a figure, a statistic I, I discovered and, and, and drove me even more to kind of think about what we're doing in schools and how we're supporting the most vulnerable, the ones who need it the most, to change their life chances. <clears throat> Our job isn't to teach the students we want, it's to teach the students that we have. And you don't have to be a teacher to teach children how to behave. Collectively, we show children what we expect of them and we show them. We show them and we tell them we never give up on them. If I go back to the easy way out and dealing with young people who, who, who struggle with their behaviour, we could uncall them, we could stick them in an isolation room, we can request their home educated, permanently, permanently exclude the lot of them. But that's not right. And we need to be committed to the change that we want to see based on the behaviours that we can control, our own. So at the beginning of this session, I asked you, what are you a teacher of? What are you a teacher of now? I'm a teacher of social skills. I'm a teacher of love, respect, kindness, compassion. I also teach drama and English. So some suggested reading for you. 
I absolutely think, um, you know, all of these books are, are fabulous. The Restorative Practice by Mark Finnis, that hasn't been released yet. I have pre-ordered my copy, but I know from hearing Mark speak, it, it will be a wonderful book. So do, do pre-order if you can. But also understanding, so the, the book with uh, the You Think I'm Evil talks about young people who've suffered adverse traumatic experiences in their childhood and how that plays out in their, uh, in their, in their life. Not all children are evil or badly behaved. Once we change our language around um, what that child is or who that child is, what the parents are, who they are and what communities are like, we start to change the way we perceive, those, perceive them. And that's the start. Self-reflection for all of us is key. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? I'm going to see if I've got some time. Wow. <clears throat> Can't see any. That went a lot quicker than I thought it was going to go. Are there any questions? You can raise your hand or ask me anything. Unmute yourself, that's not a problem at all. God oh, bless you. Thank you everyone for your kind words, that's lovely. My top tips for trainees from September. <clears throat> Your first thing is to build those relationships. You get to know those young people. You get to know what their likes are, their dislikes. Understand <clears throat> what makes them feel worried or what makes them feel a bit concerned, what excites them. And whatever you do, be their champion. Uh, Rita Pearson talks about, you know, we're not always going to like uh, the children that we teach. But <clears throat> it's really important that they never, ever get to see that. Uh, we know, we're human, but so are they. And if we think about the interactions we have as adults and the things that affect us as adults, just imagine how that might affect them. Be their champion all of the time, every day. Oh, thank you, Lindsay. Shabifa. Zina, hi, yeah. hello. hello. Um, just looking through your chat, I'm so sorry. I did, I did take the video off because I've not put anything on this face and my I, hair is a mess, I woke up a mess. Um, but it doesn't matter, we're all friends in here. Can I just say number one, thank you. But number two, there were a few in that chat when you scroll down as well who said, could they um, have the PowerPoint? Because I think you had some fabulous resources there. Um, yeah. I don't know whether you can show us that slide again with your um, Twitter handle. Have you got an email address? Absolutely, that people, you know, I'll do that now. I will do that now. Oh, that's gone to the end. I go back to the beginning. I exit that and I go to the beginning. That's absolutely not a problem. There you go. Can you see that? Nope, not yet. No? Okay, right, here we go. There you go. Now? Perfect, thank Yay. you. So I'm absolutely happy to share these resources. Um, and if you ever want to have a conversation with me about anything, um, do get in touch. I'd be more than happy to speak to you. Um, it took me some time. It took me six months, 15 years ago, to realise that relationships were the most important thing. And I've held on to that. And I can tell you now, when you get to know those young people, you see behind the barriers, you see behind what's going on in their lives and you think you know I'm going to champion you whether you like it or not and that's the most important thing to remember you know the ones that want the relationships are the ones that will push you away um but they're almost testing you they're almost saying you know I'm going to see how far I can push this person and 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 I've done that once and I shouted and he turned around and this student said to me I was waiting for you to to shout at me and I was just wondering when that was going to happen oh how awful and I, what I did was apologize. I couldn't apologize more. Um, so it's really important that we're, we're just authentic and, and be kind. We, we need to be kind. Okay. Are there any other questions? Oh. Any other questions? I can't see my, thank you Zina. What if they don't like you? Oh, bless you. Um, do you know what? We, we can quite often misinterpret and misunderstand what, what young people say. They might not like you at first, but it's not for them to kind of tell you 
you need to kind of figure it out for yourself if they don't if they don't like you is there something that you're saying something that you're doing are you sometimes really sarcastic because young people don't like sarcasm um they, they don't take it very well so what is it you're doing that make them might make them feel that um they shouldn't like you i suppose remember that you know we're the adult in the room we need to be really self-reflective all of the time how do you balance being assertive and being kind sometimes in that, that um those boundaries and those high expectations of what you need to hold on to every single day. So and as soon as you drop those boundaries, as soon as you drop those expectations, they will start to push them. So having them doesn't mean, you know, you, you need to say, right, that's it. You know, start losing your temper or setting detentions constantly. It's about having that conversation. You know what my expectations are. My expectations are X, Y, Z. And I do this because of X, Y, and Z, and holding on to those all of the time, and, and, and smiling. You know, you have to smile, you have to be um, consistent. If, if children start to feel they don't know who you are as a person, um, they start to get a bit worried, and they start to think, well, hold on a minute. Um, you know, one minute she's smiling, then she's growling, then she's shouting, then she's happy. But they don't like that inconsistency, so you need to be consistent. Okay, we need to go because the next session is going to start. Thank you so much to everybody who attended. I feel really honoured that you are all here. Um, and my imposter syndrome has, has left the building officially. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.